I'm a co-founder and material specialist here at Natura Design Studios. Uh, we work with fungi to grow various materials, um, but we focus primarily on producing homeware and furniture. Uh, we also do a lot of education, outreach, contracting and consultancy for other companies. And yeah, so working with mycelium seems like a very strange uh, statement to make if you don't understand and think about uh, what we're doing. So working with mycelium, which is what makes up mushrooms um, and fungi. So what we have here, if that works well. So yep. this is the mycelium that we work with. So it's the, uh, the living system that, that makes a fungi. And through that and through a various uh, step processes, we can actually form it to grow products. So for example, we have our bowls right here, um, really kind of sturdy things. It's made of a mix of the, the fungi actually growing and digesting, uh, as well as organic wood waste. And in this case, it was spoon carving waste, um, just to show the circularity. Um, but we can do various different kind of uh, colors, textures, forms. Um, it's very much like um, uh, you have to cast it in a way. So if you have a mold or a form, you can, you can form it to that. So yeah, so through this kind of workshop, I'm just gonna be going through two uh, parts of the steps. The first step, which is how do you get a culture and how do you get started? Uh, and the last step, which is uh, actually packing and growing your final product. So start with, we're going to be, and what I did over the weekend was, and I actually went and collected some, so if it doesn't focus very well, <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is horse or also known as Fomus fomentarius, and this is birch polypore which is um, Betulina piptoporus, if I'm remembering correctly. Latin is uh, uh, a little bit of a struggle. Um, so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be breaking open this room and uh, taking a very sterile cut of the, the tissue inside. And from that, we're going to be adding it to our Petra dishes, which are just really sterile nutrient sources that the mycelium will happily start growing onto. And then from that, you can kind of see how it starts to, to grow out from the center and spread outwards. Um, and then through that, you can keep that culture, you can keep reproducing it and adding it to new plates, or you can add it to stuff like grain spawn, which is uh, technically you could see it as mushroom uh, seed. Um, so that the mycelium actually um, colonizes Brain. And then once you have that form, then you can break that up in with your organic substrates. Um, so in this case, if you were to be doing it to that step, you'd be adding it to your to your wood or um, uh, things like hemp shiv, and the mycelium will then again colonize that, and you have a, a like a ready to go mix uh, to which you just have to break it up and pack it to a mold and let it set. And then once it's set, you have your finished product. Uh, like we're, like I said previously, mycelium is the, uh, it's known as the high full structure. It's uh, long cables of filament, which are single cells uh, or single wall cells. And together they clump together to form uh, things like mushrooms. Um, so, you know, this is basically the root system technically of what a mushroom is, although it's not technically correct, but um, yeah. yeah, that's what mycelium is. Uh, mostly in soil and it grows on any organic mass so you know leaves things like that they can grow and inhabit trees uh, they can even inhabit insects they inhabit us as well so fungi aren't necessarily just limited to the forest although if it's inhabiting you you've got problems go see a doctor <laughs> um, and uh, yeah you can find it really everywhere uh, but the specific species that we're working with we're working mainly with what's known as conchs so they are, you know, hard bodied species that um, are usually found all year round. So they're not ones that emerge and then disappear. They just stay there all the time and just grow in size when the season permits it to grow. And um, yeah, so the, like I was saying before, the two species we're working with mm -hmm. is the horsehoof fungus and the birch polypore, both of which are found on birch trees, uh, almost exclusively. And, um, 
yeah, because of that, things like the, the horsehoof fungus actually works really well as a fire starter because it absorbs a lot of the chemicals in birch trees, which birch uses as an antifreeze, where, where this guy actually uses it for food, but for us, we can use it to start fires. I would assume trial and error um, as most things in life, but um, the first recorded use of um, uh, mushrooms really, and also it happens to be this species right here, horsey fungus, was about 5,000 years ago. So um, uh, Oatsy, uh, Oatsy the Iceman uh, was, was found, his fossilized skeleton was found. And on his hip, he had a conch uh, such as this, which if you split it in half and you put an ember in, you can actually close the conch and carry technically what would be fire. So it was really the first instance of uh, humans being able to travel and transport fire and move into warmer climes. Other than the, the other uses of fungi, we're not really sure where we got that information from and we definitely have lost a lot of it, but we're starting you know, in the past 100 years to start really investigating what fungi can do for for us, but very medicinally, um, you know, food wise, um, and yeah, we learned about what their capabilities truly can be. The, the species that, you, oh, the um, genre species that you're talking about is known as mycorrhizal fungi. Um, so they actually connect and create a partnership bond with trees, uh, specifically through their roots. And uh, through that, in a forest, you could have, you know, several different trees connected via mycelium, via mushrooms, uh, to form one big structure. Within that, you know, if um, there's any invaders, and by invaders, like insects, things like that, or even deer roaming through, you can send signals across to, to warn other trees to start producing chemicals that would uh, otherwise try and repel uh, insects and, and animals. Uh, but other than that, they also trade nutrients and resources. So um, uh, trees can produce uh, sugar uh, or glucose, uh, whereas fungi cannot because they cannot synthesize it. So they actually do a trade off of carbon and nitrogen for sugar in a very or ever changing kind of rate, um, which, you know, I can only assume the fungi set the, <laughs> set the ground rules on that. Um, so, yeah, they, they can do a lot of, of things like that. And other than just food, med medicine, and materials that can actually be used to remediate um, soil or uh, just ecosystems. They uh, will uh, hyperaccumulate heavy metals and toxins. So you can actually uh, propagate them and get them to kind of harvest away all of the uh, bad toxins in the soil to try and return the ecosystem back to what it once was. And yeah. fungi spawns from mycelium. So just, just to be clear, mycelium's in the ground and what spawns yes. out of that is fungi. Yeah, so that's that's in the ground, that is the mushroom, and in general, this is fungi. Yeah. Uh, just to give an yeah. over. I'll go through the kit and then I'll just do a quick um, safety disclaimer as well on anything that could be hazardous. Um, I have set myself on fire way too many times to <laughs> still be doing this. Um, so hopefully yeah. I can help you catch out before you do that. It'll get so, more clicks on YouTube if you do. But yeah, I, don't I mean, want setting to, myself on fire right now would, <laughs> would, would be good. All right. Um, through the tools, um, we uh, to start off with the environment. So we're in a very sort of still air uh, environment. If you were doing it at home, you could do it in the bathroom or sometimes in the kitchen, depending on on how open your kitchen is. You just really want somewhere quite still. Um, it, that will allow you to just keep a very sterile space. Any kind of work you're doing with any sterile media, as soon as you open that plate, if you don't have any means of keeping it sterile you will get bacteria, molds, things like that forming on it. And that's just not what you want. You want to try and uh, grow just a pure culture, nothing else on the plate. Um, so starting with your environment, somewhere nice and still. In terms of sterility, 
I would be doing this in a flow hood uh, just to ensure complete sterility, but you wouldn't be able to hear me over the sound of the, the fans going. So uh, our next best alternative is using a Bunsen burner. So thinking about the Bunsen burner is when you have the flame going, uh, a nice big blue flame, you actually create a uh, dome of sterility around it where the air is being sucked up and pushed away. So you don't actually have any particles falling down from above. You have this plumage of, of wind currents that keeps, it, uh, keeps the area around you really clean. So in this case, we're gonna have that position there with the flame going and we'll be doing any work right close to the, to the flame uh, and really just making sure that if we have anything open, we have it open as, as little as possible uh, to make sure that we don't get any contaminants dropping on it. Um, we have our Petri dishes here. So these are, are have been pre-poured and uh, are completely sterile. So the, the, the nutrient on it is just agar with some sugars. And really that is what you would use for bacteria or fungi. Um, so hence why you've got to be really careful not to expose it to anything else because anything's happy to grow on it. Um, and in terms of keeping our Petri dishes sealed and sterile, we have uh, what's known as parafilm. So this is a, uh, it's a breathable film. Where you just peel off the plastic, uh, not the plastic, the paper layer, and you'll actually stretch it around the plate. And that just really allows the, the oxygen and carbon dioxide to uh, go back and forth, but it stops any dust or anything. So the agar you can get from Amazon, um, you just search agar agar. And um, with that, our recipe is what's known as MEA, so malt extract agar. Um, so we're using agar agar and malt barley um, syrup, uh, which is our sugar source, and then a little sprinkle of additional yeast. And then we add the water, we put it in our bottles and sterilize it. And then we, we have our medium to work with. Okay. Uh, agar that we work with comes from seaweed. Yeah. Um, so it's meant to be, uh, I mean, I'm not vegan myself, but they advertise it as being the vegan gelatin. Um, we couldn't really use gelatin itself because, uh, it is meat based and fungi just aren't too partic uh, particular about eating flesh. Um, so yeah, okay. um, other than that, we have our alcohol, mm -hmm. which is, uh, um, is at 70%. So, um, the reason we do 70% is any higher and it evaporates too quickly that it's not effective of actually killing the cells and you will inhale a lot more of it and get drunk a lot <laughs> quicker um, and any lower and it's just not potent enough to actually do any damage to any cells so uh, what we do for that is to spray any tools to spray ourselves and it just it sterilizes all the surfaces that we're working with um, and then we have a mask everyone should be familiar it will stop me contaminating the work that i'm doing uh, and if you were working with anything that had a lot of um, uh, mold on it, even though if you've got to that point, you've done something really wrong, um, it will help just kind of protect your, your uh, airways from breathing in any, any mold. It, on small amounts, it's not too much of a problem, but if you're breathing in a lot of it, then be aware of it. Um, and then tool-wise, we have our, our uh, it's very hard to see in the camera, uh, um, but it's just a standard long-handled scalpel blade. And in terms of working with the conch, it's a bit odd um, material to work with. We have some tweezers and some scissors if it really gets desperate. Um, and <laughs> so the, the reason we expand from our culture plates to our grain spawn is just in a case of, of how quickly it can expand and grow. So if you think about if you took one little square from that and put it into this bag, it would take so long for it. To, whereas if you colonize some grain with it, you have lots and lots of little inoculation points that when you break it up and mix it into the substrate, it, it can quite easily uh, grow and overcome uh, the whole um, substrate mix. And in terms of why we use wood, you don't necessarily need to use wood, you could use anything organic. Um, so, you know, you can use straw, hay, hemp shiv, you can use coffee grounds as a su uh, supplement. Um, you know, you could even, I mean, I don't know I'm saying organic, but you can even if you can train it and really have that much time to commit, you can even start training it to digest plastics. So, you know, it, 
wood organic substrates and things like that are just so the easiest food, thing to work with it's food for the yeah uh, yeah basically it, it's food but it also provides the the structure for the mycelium to hold it together so you know the, the products that we grow aren't pure mycelium because to actually grow something purely out of mycelium would just take so long and in terms of the strength it would probably be like a very flexible cork almost like like um, silicon in terms of flexibility so um it really provides the structure and the mycelium is the thing bonding it all together and just kind of being the glue to set it all um, so yeah okay so typically what i would do as a, as a procedure for coming into the lab is it, it sounds quite extreme but if i ever come into the lab i'll shower get fresh change of clothes brush my teeth like we are the biggest source of contamination in this work so you know really it'd be better if we weren't here uh but we don't have robots so uh, i'm here um so yeah we just kind of wash ourselves down as much as possible and then when we are actually working typically you should wear gloves um like a latex or a, a nitrile glove um but i'm not really a fan of the the plastic waste it produces so i just I, I'm in a habit of, uh, of spraying my hands down at least every 15 minutes or in between tasks. So I'm just ensuring that I'm as clean as possible. Um, and, you know, on top of that, you can wear a lab coat or anything. Like that. But for this purpose, I'm, I'm just as is. I will be wearing the mask whilst I'm doing it. Um, and yeah, uh, health and safety. Yeah. You're working with an open flame and you're working with something flammable. So when you are spraying yourself down and things like that really be careful of if your if your hands are still wet with the alcohol don't be putting your hands over the flame um same <laughs> with if you're spraying down your scalpel blade careful not to put it in the flame until it's dried um i have doing that simple move set myself on fire twice um so sometimes it's just best to wait a little bit longer just to make sure that it's dry or if you're really sensible and smart and thinking ahead you can use a paper towel to just Make sure to try that uh, before you uh, put the scalpel blade into the flame. Everybody uh, watching this now is getting quite excited to see having the blue flame. We see me on fire. Yeah, to see how <laughs> this is going to turn out. Um, so, <laughs> um, but yeah. So what we will actually do whilst we're working with the species is to ensure the blade is as sterile as possible. We'll actually put it into the flame and get it glowing hot um so like i say if you have alcohol and the rest of it then you, you're up in flames um but we'll be doing that in between transfers to make sure that every cut we make on the mushroom it's uh, we're not actually adding any bacteria any outside contamination to it because if i split this open completely in the center it's sterile um, it's similar to why you can eat steak raw as long as you cook the outside because the center of the flesh is still sterile because it, it was a living thing um, so as soon as you open that up, you want to be careful that you're not getting contaminated to, uh, to what you're trying to keep clean. Um, so yeah, I have everything set up. Okay. Usually when I'm working, I'll just, you know, kind of go through my head and think, you know, have I got everything? Cause the worst thing ever is to get yourself all cleaned off and sterile and stuff. And then remember that, I don't know, your supplies are out in the garage and it's like, I've got to start again. Um, I've done that too many times. Um, so what's so, the yeah, first, uh, first stage of the uh, of the process? So the first stage always is cleaning things down. Um, so I'm wearing the mask now, um, and that's just kind of protecting everything around. I haven't got the flame on yet, so like that I can hold the, the top of it and just kind of spray around it. Um, and then it's just a case of spraying down the surface and just making sure that everything is kind of um, uh, soaked in the alcohol. If um, if you're wanting to be conservative, you can get some tissue paper and just kind of wipe it down, and that'll just make sure that everything you spread around is kind of job. Um, and then spraying our hands and arms as well. So if you just give it a good coat and just you know you should know these things. Like if I'm having new things on how to keep yourself clean, then COVID has no. Um, so yeah, we have that all set up. We have our mushroom here. What I'm going to do with that as well, I'm just going to spray that down. 
and that just you know makes sure that any of the the spores or anything like that or any bacteria that might have been living on the surface stays dead um, and yeah then spraying the scalpel down typically what i'll do is i'll just spray that down wipe it a little bit carefully and then stick that on the side and then once i have that all set up i'm just double checking to see where everything is arranged depending on if you the right the left hand typically have the stuff that i'm transferring on the right and my fresh plates on the left um, so with these i'll just put that there i've not lifted it off completely because if i lift it off completely then spores can come in from the side but i'm just having it prepped right there so that when i need to retrieve a plate i can do it easily and now I spray it down now that alcohol's dried a little bit i can hopefully not set myself on fire so you probably won't be able to see that on the camera, although yeah. maybe a little bit. Yeah, we can see it. Um, so, you know, we have the flame there. Um, what we'll do is we'll just hold it into the, into the flame to get it actually glowing hot. I'll see if I can get it glowing hot for the camera. Um, so you'll, no, you can't see it very well. Yeah. But anytime you do any transfers, you just want to make sure it's, it's glowing hot. So I've got that set up. Same again, spraying my hands down. When I'm working, I mean, for lab day, I will get very drunk um, with the amount of alcohol that is really required to uh, to go through this. Um, <laughs> especially more so if we're not doing small culturing, but we're actually doing big, uh, big panels. Um, I don't have a sense of smell, which is a benefit because I think most of my colleagues can't actually be in the room when I'm spraying the alcohol. Uh, whereas I can stay here and just slowly get drunk over time. Um, <laughs> So we've got our mushroom and everything's sort of ready and sorted. These guys are pretty easy to actually uh, uh, rip in half um, mm. sometimes, he says. Um, we will actually use a scalpel. Um, so just kind of chomping into it. This species is very uh, spongy. It's really good for actually making paper. So yeah. if you ever see a birch polypore out in the woods, um, if you take it home, blend it, uh, well, chop it into cubes and blend it. And then if you add it into a bath of water and actually um, uh, then sieve it, you can actually create a really nice paper from it. Wow. But yeah, yeah, so just washing it down again. I have all set. I'm just gonna bring a couple of plates to the side. When you're first starting, I would recommend only just you know take out like one two plates every time working and seal it up as soon as you've finished adding what you need to it's just because you're not going to be as proficient in staying clean over that time but um so i'm gonna i'm not too sure how well it will look on the camera but what i'm going to be doing on the mushroom is i'm just going to be cutting a little square to be able to get like a, a sliver of the the flesh from it um so i'm just getting the blade red hot and then keeping the the mushroom close to the actual um, uh, flame itself. I'm just kind of cutting a fracture. Be really careful not to uh, cut through the mushroom into your hands. Um, it's not advisable. There's a lot of lot of hidden risks in uh, in this uh, industry. Um, so these conks are very kind of um, spongy, so they're they're very hard to work with sometimes. So I've just taking a little away i'm just putting the blade there and then with the scalp uh, with the tweezers i'm just getting them red hot as well and then i can actually just pull the piece out and then putting the mushroom back down i can then add it to the plate and then close it and then just resetting my tools to the side and this is parafilm again so it's paper backing but you can actually peel the layer off and then with the layer that you peeled it from, you can just, you just put it to, I'll see if I can do that like that. Uh, yeah. You can just kind of stretch it and it just kind of wraps around and it kind of seals itself in. So once you have it done, sometimes you have a little bit of a dog's ear on it, but then, you know, that kind of acts to, uh, to kind of scissors. Um, and then what you would do is kind of repeat that process. So. I'm just going to do one more uh, one more cut on it, and if anyone has any questions in the meantime, feel free to shout it out to Dylan. I can answer that whilst I'm doing this. Um, but yeah, so from here you would add it to your plate, and 
it would start growing out from there. Um, and through that, you'll have a working culture ready to be uh, transferred into some grain spawn and expanded further or, you know, just um, added to, uh, to another plate to expand it, um, getting that hot again. So whilst whilst you're, um, you're heating everything up on the Bunsen burner, I'm, I'm curious um, how it doesn't just sort of fry or frizzle the mycelium as you're pulling it off. So with the, um, oh God, sometimes you get really shit bits of paraffin. Um, with the mushroom itself, it's kind of self-insulating, like there's such a big mass of it that you don't actually end up killing all of it. You just end up, uh, you know, charring the surface of it. Yes. If you are working with just, um, just agar and just the cultures, mm -hmm. you will want to cool the plate down. So what I can actually do for you is I'll just reset my space and I'll just show you how we take one of our cultures. So we have our, our culture fully grown and fully sealed and labeled and everything. And so what we would do is same again, get the blade hot um, in time when it starts to. Um, just leave that there, clean ourselves down because we're resetting. If you're doing things in between, like you're working with tissue cultures and then with uh, the pure cultures, you really wanna make sure you're as clean as possible because you've just made yourself as messy as you could. You then want to uh, peel the parafilm off and then that plate is primed, ready to go. And then by putting out some dishes, you can have that ready. And then we go for the cut. So same again, we'll just heat the blade up. And stay on there. Whilst the blade into the clean plate to cool it off. And then from there, we can just cut some squares, making sure to not lean over the work whilst you're doing it. And then you can just add the squares and kind of repeat in a kind of robotic function. And then once you have that done, you can then get your parafilm to actually seal the plates up. Um, so from here, this culture will grow to be another one like it is itself. So it's, it's cloning, um, cloning the culture. So from there, you have your plate and you just want to keep it a little bit finished. So yeah. they all grow at much uh, varying sort of speeds and also different characteristics as well. So um, I'll just show you some plates in a second of ones that I transferred on the 17th. What day is it today? Um, so it's maybe like three, four days ago. Um, yeah. So let me grab some. So we've got this one here, this one here. So we have here, we have, um, uh, Armillaria melea, also known as honey fungus. So you can kind of see it's going to look fluffy over the square, but not really, not really much going on. Yeah. Whereas we have here, it is uh, a, type, a species of reishi known as, uh, or the Latin is Ganoderma lucidium, and that is much further grown. So you can see in terms of the difference, like it uh, really depends on the species you're growing and. Um, in terms of actually like what they, what the difference can look, um, let me see, I'm growing some odd plates. And in terms of also smell as well and things like that, they all smell very different. Um, so this one is um, tempeh. So it's what you use for, for making tempeh. The species itself um, is Rhizopus oligaris. Um, and then, you know, compared to, to this one, which is um, uh, uh, called Mazapotec, and you can see again, like the, the difference in the actual style of growing. And yeah. uh, the, the tempeh is so quick to grow, uh, hence why you can actually kind of do that one in your kitchen. Um, Yeah, so uh, personally, I have a little bit of an a, a, a unofficial database um, in terms of just kind of listing it right now. 
the a lot of the conch species are the the best species for producing material simply because the actual hyphae itself are, is quite thick and sturdy and it produces quite a, a large amount of uh, chitin and chitin is what um you know like insect shells and things like that are made from so in terms of creating a material uh, chitin production is kind of the the best aim for it um other species you can use is like oyster mushrooms which are quick growers but not necessarily good material um as in um, strength weight uh, ratio wise um other than that you can produce kind of a uh, pure uh, fabric using like tempeh and schizophilian commune and yeah but I mean I've got a database if if you are uh, wanting to to have it all listed out feel free to get in touch uh, through the website or through Instagram and I can pass that on it's not a problem so um if everyone's finished with the, the Q and A, uh, sorry, with the um, any questions, so we have our samples taken. What we're going to do is we're just going to incubate them, uh, put them in temperatures between 20 to 25 degrees. Depends on the species you've collected. If you're uh, collecting it in the UK or in colder climes, you can. They're happy to be at a lower temperature. But if it's more, you know, if you're working with species from like Brazil, South America, typically they want around 25 degrees. Um, but yeah, so from that, we would, going through the virtual process, we would let it grow into a full plate, and then with some sterile, uh, sterilized grain, we would add a few squares of that and let it colonize it, and then we would add it to our substrate uh, over here. And basically, if anybody has any questions, now's the time. If not, we will move on to working with the substrate and um, actually packing the mold itself. So. Yeah. But what I'm doing is uh, just replacing the cartridge. So um, typically these last about a week if you're using them constantly. Um, the flame was getting a little too low. Um, so I'm just going to replace that. But yeah, in terms of like if you're wanting to get in this industry and not sure kind of what sterile uh, procedure to go down, a lot of people use like glove boxes, which are just boxes with armholes in. Um, or you can use a flow hood, which is you know, it's blowing uh, filtered sterilized air through. My uh, sort of recommendation is just get a Bunsen burner. It costs 35 quid. The cartridge itself is like three pound, two pound 50. Uh, and, you know, it just costs nothing. And you have the full freedom to work around compared to if you have a glove box, you have your arm set in. And I mean, the, the majority of the times that I've set myself on fire, it's been using a glove box. Um, so uh, I would recommend against using a glove box. <laughs> The, the plates will, if you just leave them out and about and not refrigerated, they'll last um, probably about a month. They'll, they'll, they'll last longer, but really the longer you leave them out when they're fully grown and fully digested all the nutrients, the more likely they are to develop mutations and some of which can be bad um, for the mycelium, not for us. Um, so really in terms of plates, I wouldn't use your plate if it was older than a month, if you haven't refrigerated it. If you have been able to put it in a fridge, depends on how early on. Um, so if you put this one in where it's, you know, about halfway through, this plate could last six months in the fridge. Um, if it is fully colonized, so it's gone to the edge, I would give it about two, three months um, if you have it in the fridge. Um, but there are other different ways to preserve, uh, preserve cultures long term, um, one of which is, is known as a slant culture. So it's um, taking a test tube and you have a small amount of nutrients with some wood in it and you basically add the culture and you put it in the fridge straight away and that can last up to you know five ten years mm -hmm. um and if you happen to have a minus 80 freezer you know if you do please get in touch um mm -hmm. but if you if you put a culture in there and put it in a cryo vial you can have that last indefinitely um but like i say it's a very rare ability to be able to do that kind of thing yeah. So um, in its dry state, it takes dyes really easily. It's very kind of um, absorptive. 
Um, it doesn't have a problem thinking it dies then. In its living state, it can be somewhat more resistant because if it doesn't like what you're trying to put on it, it will just push it out. But if you if you do have the time to be able to train them, so you can see on these plates, these plates are green. Um, you can actually uh, get them to take in dye and show it in its in the mycelium itself. Um, so you can get some species that will will pull the color out of the plate and not show it, but then some will will actually show it. So um, if you're wanting to actually dye the mycelium itself, it takes a little bit of time if it's living. If it's dead, that's not a problem. Um, and in terms of just natural colors, you can get a lot of species that. Uh, produce a lot of different colors like yeah. you can get blues greens blacks um uh slight reds like pinkish um so you can really work with a lot of actually what the species have to offer in terms of its own color palette um if you want to grow something like uh with different colors onto it and i mean in terms of um uh, like species and variants like this is rushy and this is horsey fungus uh so you can really invest in terms of the, the color palette. Um, and yeah, it really just depends on what species you're using um, really at the end of the day. As I was saying before, the step difference between what we've just done previously and now is that we will produce grain spawn to break up and mix into our bag. Um, so kit wise, we have scissors for opening the bag. We've got a Bunsen burner still. Um, thinking it up when we're finished packing it. We have a box just to, to really just break up and mix the, the substrate into and scoop it from. And then in this case, we have two glass bowls as our mold. I don't have any other molds available at such short notice. Um, so we're gonna be packing uh, basically what, what would become one of these. Um, and then we have our alcohol again as well. So yeah, um, the, the kind of first step is to take our bag and break it up. Yeah, but it, it really does depend on kind of A, what species you're using and B, what substrate you're using. So, you know, if your woody substrate is very, uh, it's not very dense, then you will get it to feel like cork or even polystyrene. If you are working with really dense chips, then you can get it to feel pretty much close to like um, uh, wood, but with like a suede kind of fabric over the top of it. Um, like, you know, for example, these guys, are like it's, it's just absolutely sturdy as hell. Um, and it's really kind of uh, really firm. And with a center of this that I can actually stand on and it will support my whole weight. And when the step off, it will just be as I hadn't stood on it before. Um, so you can get really good strength to weight ratio um, from it. Uh, I just saw one of the questions. So yeah, it's um, basically, it's one of our uh, bags of substrate. So this is colonized uh, substrate. In this case, it's hemp shiv. Um, so it's fully colonized through. And what I've just done is I've just broken it up because in this form, you can't really work with it very well. Uh, yeah. um, and the, the reason why I've done it in the bag as well is just to keep it as sterile as possible. But um, my, my, my colleagues have been able to bring garden chippers into the lab uh, to stick the blocks in and just spit out the substrate. Um, just because sometimes it gets so dense that you can't really, or well, you can, but you'll end up with forearms like Popeye after you finish breaking it up. Um, so, yeah. And just in terms of um, uh, working process, like because the the substrate is really heavily colonized with the fungi. It's a lot safer to work with in terms of actually be able to fight off a lot of the contamination that might drop on it. So with the, the actual packing herbs and things like that, you can do it in a kitchen with simply just an open flame and you don't have to be as careful as you would with working with uh, your Petri dishes where one single spore of a different thing can fail it. Um, so feel free, you know, don't, worry too much like be aware of sterility and try and be clean but it's not going to be the end of the downfall if you're not able to um so yeah and bathrooms are typically a good place to start in terms of an environment to, to uh you know work with this stuff so yeah i have it all broken up and then 
what I'm going to do is just go around um, spraying and sterilizing everything that I'm working with. Um, so, you know, just going through. And just a little shameless plug as well. If you are wanting to have some kit to create your molten products we do actually sell these kits um and i'm sure dylan will post a a message on about the website um so if you are wanting to have your own go at it then you know feel free to to drop us a, a call or drop us an order um and we basically make them to order so if you place an order it'll take about two weeks for us to colonize it and ship it out to you but just make sure that you have the the most viable material that you can work with uh, um, so I'm just spraying things down, keep that off to the side, and put the Bunsen burner on. You know, I think I need a, a little calendar on the wall saying it's like, it's been 70 days since I set myself on fire. Um, <laughs> I think that would be a, a motivating thing. So I'm just wiping the excess alcohol down from this bowl will basically be where I tip my substrate into. I'm just start, uh, just wiping down the ex excess alcohol just so the alcohol doesn't actually damage the mycelium itself. We're only wanting to keep it clean. We're not wanting to kill everything that's in it. And as well, just spraying these down. Always try and keep things around the Bunsen burner. So you see sometimes I put them behind. It's just because you really want to work within a radius. Um, if you're working over here, then you're really not getting any of the benefits of having the flame go. If you're working with petri dishes, then you want a radius about there. So really you want to, you want the petri dish to be touching it. Right. Um, okay. If you're working with substrates, then yeah, probably actually to be honest, the rule would probably be as much as the substrate is away, <laughs> you can kind of work from it. Yeah. Um, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to be when it's in substrate form right next to the flame. But the closer, closer the better. Just don't set yourself on fire. Um, right. So bag sterilized. Everything sterilized down. I've chipped up the substrate already. So I'm just gonna uh, get some clips um, and just fold on. So by folding over the kind of straw as a seal, and then. From that, we can actually cut the corner off. So the bag is now open. Uh, usually, I, I use the clips just so that um, you know when I finish tipping it or finish using it, I can simply just put the clips back on because I don't want to. I don't want to waste the rest of the substrate. I want to use as much as it as I possibly can. So, in the sense of this, I'm just going to keep that there, put it off, and just pour. A reasonable amount. Sometimes you get clumps, so you might have to get with it. And probably for this, you want about that. Then reclip it up and put that to the side. And then sterilizing your hands. You can just start working with it. So typically with the bowls, I'll just put in a handful to start with, and then you can set in the original bowl. And then with that, I'll just put that in there. What you can actually do is you can kind of scoop and skirt it around. And the the rest will fall into the bowl. I'm going to need some more substrate. You don't want to pack it too densely because the more dense you pack it, the less airflow the, uh, the substrate has. And if it doesn't have a way of, of uh, purging the carbon dioxide that it's producing, then any bacteria, any kind of uh, uh, anemic, no, not anemic, uh, aerobic, I can't remember which way it is, um, but any carbon dioxide living um, species will will start to grow. Um, so I'm just kind of tucking around the edges. Um, like I say, you don't have to be massively clean about it. If there's any clumps, uh, just have somewhere to put them off to the side. You can break most of them up, but it's up to you if you want to if you want to put that time in. Um, 
so yeah, I would probably cut there and just cut it around and then just with the rest of the substrate, just tip it off to the side. you can use um i would recommend like glass and plastic and sometimes metal like stainless steel if you can but stainless is quite expensive um don't use wood <laughs> for the given like uh like reason that they will just digest it and they will just bond to it you want something that's easy for them to to slip out of them um so you know typically like if it's a very smooth surface material then it's quite easy to pull out um but you can if you are really wanting to use wood you can um uh, lacquer it with um uh, like vinyl paints and things like that but still you can probably use it for about one mold before it actually starts to uh want to come back out um yeah and then in terms of of had it all packed um it wants a little bit of airflow but not too much so what i typically do is i just poke four holes in and then with this tape here um so this is called micropore tape. Um, you get it in a lot of first aid kits. Um, it's meant to be like a, a breathable film, but it doesn't allow um, particles and things like that to go through. So with just a bit of the tape to match where I put the holes, I'm just going to put that over the top. And this will just allow airflow, but stop any contaminants going in and out. And yeah, so once you have that done, this is like a really primitive way of cutting up either want to incubate it and like this one right here so this is starting to colonize so you can see um the kind of fluffy mycelium starting on the top this was packed five days ago um so it really takes with horse hoof fungus it takes a lot grow. with things like reishi it grows really quickly Ooh. and we have a straggler at the back here that is actually <laughs> actually no fruiting from the uh, from the bowl itself. It's this funny. guy is eager to eager to come out. It does look. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what we would do from that step, once it's um, fully colonized, is like the primitive most primitive method would be to get a box and um, uh, some racking like this. Uh, if you put the racking in the bottom put your carefully take your mold out and rest it on it and then you want to just be spraying down the inside of the box with some water you know maybe once every day uh, and that will just make sure that the the outer layer of the mycelium can develop and it really does create a lot of the the strength that comes with the product um, and you know once you're happy with the color with the style and everything like that you take it out and just dry it so um, you can use an oven, so you could just stick it in an oven and put it on a temperature of about 80 degrees for two to three hours. But a lot of the, well, all of the species we'll work with are native to the UK. They are species that we've collected from a forest just five miles down the road. So what we actually do is we put them on the windowsill and actually let them dry naturally. Um, you do have to be careful that it does definitely dry because if you leave it living, it will you know, any mold or anything like that will get a chance to actually start growth. Um, so we'll just put it in a nice sunny, sunny windowsill with quite a good airflow going by and that product will dry out and, and set completely. So at that point, it's completely inert. Uh, um, and it's growing basically. Um, so yes, if it's just raw ceramic, uh, without any, any coatings on, it does like to bond to it. Um, but if you are able to glaze it, that works really well. Um, so, you know, if you're able to make any glaze, it doesn't necessarily have to be a colored glaze. You could actually do a transparent glaze just to really seal in the, in the clay. Um, but yeah, ceramics can be, a, a, a they can work sometimes, but, um, what you want really is you want the, the mold to slip out as easily as possible because if it actually starts to bond to the surface when you're pulling it out of the mold you start ripping a lot of the surface and it can create a lot of uneventies when the the product starts to skin 
uh, like in the last step, what, what I just explained. So ceramics, yeah, like say, so if you can glaze it, that's uh, that's ideal. But if not, just give it a try. And, and if you're wanting something rough just as a test piece, then it will. Yeah. So if you just use a, a plastic box like this uh, with a lid on and, and no like, it uh, doesn't matter if, it, if it's not, healed, but um, don't have any like kind of open air holes on it. Uh, you just put the, I'll actually demonstrate it to be honest, um, might as well. So we'd have that in there. We'd have the racking in it. Racking just stops the mycelium from touching the surface and start to grow flat and creating you'll see with uh, uh, things like this that it, it creates a bit of a, a flat base um, whereas if you have the the racking on it then it's it stays a little more elevated and then you simply just put that in um, keep it closed and then once every two days with your your bottle of water make sure not to mix it up with your alcohol um, you just come in and give it a spray and then leave it be um, and that would take about one to two weeks to actually produce the skinning. Um, but same again, depends on the species you're using. Right. I hope that makes sense. Just let me know if it doesn't. Oh. But yeah, so in terms of process, like that's that's really kind of, kind of all it is. Um, you know, there's a lot more to it that you can start exploring if you're wanting to produce different materials. Um, and really as well, like I always say to people, don't, don't take, I mean, it's a workshop, I'm showing you what I'm doing, but don't necessarily take what I'm doing as the only way to do it. Like, um, I really want to kind of show people and promote to people to like create your own way of working and just explore it. And, um, if someone says no, just still try it anyway, because when I was first starting out in this industry, I had the same thing where. I had a lot of science done like this work, you can't do it like this. And a lot of those things that I still did anyway actually became the biggest things that pushed me ahead in this industry. Um, so, you know, feel free to get really experimental. And it's, you know, aside from setting yourself on fire, like it's a really safe thing to be working with. Um, and I'm hoping that eventually in the future it'll become as commonplace as working with like ceramics and things like that. Um, and especially like with working with um, different types of wood um, and, and things like that. But yeah, so don't necessarily take my words law, go out and try it. And if you do have any questions, or, you know, you're hitting problems or anything like that, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and I'm more than happy to, to, to help uh, talk you through or see where the problems might be, might be coming from. A big thank you to you all. Thank you for watching listening thank you ashley no worries it's, it's been an absolute pleasure yeah definitely the weirdest way of working i i've, I've put that down as my my weirdest way of working <laughs> i've never done a live workshop well, in the lab i personally think it's worked really well um you know internet a little bit glitchy at times but you know that's the world we live in and we're you know um i think we got i'll get better internet next time <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Dio Thank you very much, everybody.